Hello and good evening. Today again we are joined with our great friend and uh, uh, senior special international <laughs> correspondent for I24 News Israel, uh, Mr. Owen Alterman, and he always gives his wisdom on Middle East geopolitics, Israel, everything to us almost uh, every month. So we are back with him. And uh, since it's time for uh, election in Israel, on, I think on 23rd they are going to vote. So we have a lot to ask him. Uh, welcome, Owen. You bet. Happy to be here. Sorry we won't have more time, but I think we'll still be able to give viewers a quick sense of what's happening here. I know uh, you, you are giving a very precious time of yours, and we uh, really uh, heartily thank you for that. Uh, Owen, tell me, how's the electoral climate in Israel? Uh, obviously, listen, we're going to our fourth elections in two years. So on one hand, people are jaded, people are sick of this. Uh, on the other hand, listen, there's always an excitement around elections. It's coinciding, as your viewers may know, with the world's leading vaccination drive. So at the same time, obviously, the weather's getting warmer. We're heading into our important holiday of Passover coming up early next week. And obviously things are starting to reopen. And after a very, very hard year, as in so many places, at least here in Israel, things are starting to look up. So it's a nice climate in that sense, heading into election day. And obviously we're all waiting to see what happens. So why people are, uh, are doing agitation? Uh, yesterday only I was seeing there were pictures of agitations and there were huge crowd. So when people are getting, getting vaccinated, uh, economy is coming back to normal, when your international relationship are all time high. So why people are agitating? Well, listen, as you said, people are very, very excited, obviously, about the economy opening up, about the success of the vaccination drive. And of course, there is a connection with the election campaign, because as you can imagine, uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is making a lot of the vaccination drive. He's taking credit for it. I think there's a consensus that he deserves at least partial credit for the success. Obviously, it's very meaningful. It's saving lives. It's saving people's income and people's livelihoods. So obviously, it's a major factor, but it may not, it's obviously not the only factor in this election campaign. There are a lot of other issues swirling around, as there always are. And it's on a knife's edge about whether Netanyahu will get the seats that he needs in Israel's parliament, whether it be for his Likud party or for his natural coalition partners, to be able to get a majority and set up the kind of government he wants, or whether his rivals would be able to put together some kind of government and get a majority themselves, or whether we're going to have another stalemate. We'll be heading back for another set of elections, probably sometime oh my God. early in the fall. Uh, those are the three scenarios. All three of the scenarios are live scenarios. I think the, the prevailing wisdom here, and, and I agree with this, is that the most likely of the three scenarios is that Netanyahu gets his 61 seats in the parliament, that he forms a government, but it's less than 50%. There, there really are three balls in the air, and we don't know which one's going to land. Owen, I always consider you to be a, a moving opinion poll who, ro who roams around Israel and collects his own data. So out of 120 Neset, that is an Israeli parliamentary seat, what do you think? Uh, how many seats will uh, the Likud party of Benjamin Netanyahu get this time? What's your Listen, opinion? There, <laughs> Likud is polling at around 29 or 30 seats in the polls. I think there's reason to expect, I won't get into all the details right now, maybe we will a little bit later on, that they could get more than that, that they could actually beat their polls. So let's say 33 seats, 34 would be a huge success right now for the Likud. So I think that's what we're looking yeah. at for there. What's more important, and this is the number everybody really has their focus on, not only what Likud gets, but what Likud plus Likud's natural allies and potential coalition partners get. Do they get 59 or 60 seats? out of 120, which is what they're getting roughly in most polls in the last few days, or whether they get that all important next seat, right? To get 61, to get a majority. And I think, again, there are three scenarios. It's less than 50% that any individual one of the three would happen. But the one with the highest chance of happening is that they break the 60. So I would say, let's say that they and their coalition partners get 62. But again, there's a lot of uncertainty. And I'll, I'll just explain to viewers a little bit why, because this is what we might be seeing, something to watch for Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Under Israel's law, there is a threshold of 3.25% to get into the parliament. Obviously, a lot of parliamentary yes. democracies have something like this, if they're not single seat constituencies and if it's a proportional system. So you have to get that number of votes to get any seats, which means that if you get 
two five percent, you get four seats in the parliament. If you get three point two four nine 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 percent, you get zero. You're totally shut out. And there are about four parties that are right on the bubble. And there's really no pollster goal as you can tell you whether that party is going to be above the threshold or below. But on election night, whether they're one vote above or one vote below could make a huge difference because it could completely huge change difference. the math of the whole parliament. So it makes it to be a lot more uncertainty, whether it's just figuring out how many seats Likud is going to get, how many seats the pro Netanyahu bloc is going to get, or for that matter, the anti Netanyahu bloc. We just don't know. And that's a big part of the reason. So that's something everybody's going to be watching out for as we start to get the results overnight Tuesday night. Uh, for, for viewers, uh, just let me tell them uh, that uh, in Israel, it's not like a, every one person is a, or candidate is a, uh, nominating uh, himself or herself from one constituency. Whole nation is considered as a single constituency and the voting takes place in the single day. And depending upon the percentage of what the party gets, they get the number of seats in their parliament. So it, it is just for the knowledge of the viewers. So right. uh, what, is the, Owen, what is the condition of uh, Benny Gantz and uh, Blue and White? Well, Gantz, as you may know, has seen better political days. Uh, in Israel's last three elections, he was a driving force. He was the main opposition candidate. The number of seats his party got rivaled the number that Likud got. Now, the number that the bloc he would have led got didn't really, again, this is making things a little simplified, rival what Netanyahu's bloc got. In any event, Gantz, as your viewers may know, decided to go into a unity government with Netanyahu last summer, and that just killed him politically. It split his movement in half because half of the movement did not go in with him. The movement was always a coalition, so part of that coalition broke off. And a lot of voters really soured on Gantz because he promised to be the opposition to Netanyahu. And then he went into a government with Netanyahu. So his party right now, Gomez, after leading a political movement that had a quarter of the votes in three Israeli elections, his party is on the bubble of being wiped out entirely. Remember I mentioned just a second ago those parties, yes. the four parties that are right on the bubble of that electoral threshold? One of them is Gantz's Blue and White Party. They could be completely shut out come Wednesday, not be in the parliament at all. And if they are, they're going to be, no matter what happens, a very, very small party. Again, with potential impact, because every party has impact, but they'll be small. Now, one footnote is, if we continue to have a political stalemate, and it goes on until November, and this Israel, it's totally possible, there is a chance that Gantz could then, under Israeli law, become prime minister. Again, I won't bore your viewers with the details, but that's what's written in the current coalition agreement. And if there's no government seated before then, then it's possible that that's going to be the law, that that remains good law, and that Gantz becomes prime minister. There's a stronger chance of happening if he remains in the parliament. And again, he might not. But even if he doesn't, he could still end up as prime minister. So we may not have seen the last of him, but he's well past his political prime. We always consider that the Indian politics is uh, complicated, but looking at Israeli system and Israeli politics, we are our politics is quite simple. Anything and everything can happen in Israeli politics. It looks like that. So, uh, how are the cases against uh, the those corruption cases against Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu going on? Well, he had a hearing uh, in court. I covered it a couple months ago uh, to make some preliminary procedural decisions. The phase of witness testimony is set to begin in a few weeks, potentially, uh, or over the spring, we should say, after the elections. So there will be, a, a, a sooner rather than later, a situation where three days a week, there are going to be witnesses giving testimony in Netanyahu's cases. So it's going to be quite an event. The cases, interestingly, directly haven't been a factor in this election. Obviously, the public knows that Netanyahu is being in, in, has been indicted and that he's going to be standing trial. But in some sense, it's already been it's already been litigated. We've had three elections about this one way or another. The public's already made up its mind what it thinks about that. Netanyahu's political persona is at the center of this campaign, right? Whether people like him or whether they don't. But the cases, interestingly enough, have been less of an issue. It's more been about Netanyahu's leadership style, his persona, his personality, what he stands for, less so than the actual cases themselves, which has been an interesting feature of this campaign. Anyway, we all consider that Rania, who has uh, got uh, 10 political lives. So I think this time he may have 11th. <laughs> uh, We're going to find and, out. Uh, now, shifting to the geopolitics of the region, uh, by uh, the Likud party is saying that uh, if they come back to power, there will be a direct flight from Mecca, from Makkah to Jerusalem. 
What is the reason behind that? Wow, I haven't heard that one, but certainly Netanyahu has floated, not been the only one, the possibility of a normalization deal with Saudi Arabia, which obviously would be a huge coup for Israel. Uh, look, obviously, it hasn't escaped any of our attention that, and I was there in the White House lawn in September. I think we had a conversation yes. about it. Yes, right? you sent me the photograph. About, of course, the normalization deals between Israel and countries in the Arab world. It's been an important part of Netanyahu's campaign particularly in the Arab sector. Uh, Netanyahu's Likud party is expecting to win maybe two parliament seats on the back of Arab voters, something unprecedented in Israeli politics. There's also a new Arab political party that has said it's interested in working potentially with Netanyahu. So this is these are new dynamics in Israeli politics. We don't know exactly how it's going to wow. work. Wow, wow. What we're all going to be watching for Tuesday, very, very interesting to see. And this has been part of, although by no means all of, Netanyahu's pitch is that he brought these peace deals, which are very popular, as you can imagine, uh, among Israel's Arab public, even as Israel's Arab politicians have come out against them. So Netanyahu sees that gap between where the Arab members of Knesset are, okay, the Arab members of parliament, and where the Arab public is, and he's going right at it to try to sell himself. Obviously, the next shoe to drop would be Saudi Arabia, potentially, and it would be super meaningful. Super uh, meaningful. There are reported it will be a jewel in your crown. Yes, the Saudi crown prince, as we all know, a few months ago. Uh, he hasn't confirmed or denied that, uh, but the Saudis haven't moved yet, we should say. Uh, we will see if they do. Uh, it's fair to say that the ball's in their court. For the most part, Israel will be quite happy to do a deal with them. It will be supported across the political spectrum here, but they have to make that decision. So uh, we will see, but I don't, obviously it's too late for anything like this to happen before the elections, but whether yeah. it happens after the elections or when, it's obviously thing it's gonna be potentially huge news for the Middle East and revolutionary. And he's making peace deals with Arab countries. I think then he is the Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace, because Nobel has done all these things in the past seven years, decades, what he has done. Yeah, listen, I'm sure Netanyahu so, would love to win the Nobel Prize. I think he was actually <laughs> nominated by someone, if I'm not mistaken. He and MBZ and Jared Kushner, if I'm not mistaken, were nominated by somebody. Uh, yeah, I don't think Netanyahu is about to win any Nobel Prizes. Uh, to say the least, he's a little bit of a controversial figure overseas. Uh, but look, the Abraham Accords is seen as a win-win here in Israel. Across the political spectrum, people are in favor. You know, I'll tell your viewers a story. It's the first time I'm actually telling the story on the record. But a few days ago, I was in the settlements talking to some of the settler leaders. And I was in Hebron talking to the spokesperson, the Jewish settlement settlers in Hebron. As you viewers may know, some of the furthest to the right or most extreme, if you will, uh, of the hardcore of the yeah. settlement movement. And I asked the head of the settlers movement, you know, do you support the Abraham Accords? And he says, of course, I mean, of course I do. Why wouldn't I support it? And he even has had contacts with people in the UAE to bring Emirati tourists to Hebron, to take tours of the settlements. I and mean, it's uh, fascinating. But that just shows just how popular these normalization deals are across the political spectrum. That said, in, this, in these elections, they've been there as an issue, but they're not the, the foremost issue. The foremost issue is, of course, the pandemic and the persona of Benjamin Netanyahu and how you feel about him. To some degree, the issue of religion and state and the role of Israel's ultra-Orthodox sector. Of course, with Arab votes in play, some Arab-specific issues have been, in, been on, the, on the agenda, such as violence in the Arab sector and the need to fight it and have more of a police presence and police strategy. So those issues have all been more higher, higher profile in terms of Israel's domestic politics than have been the normalization deals. That said, of course, in the international level and geopolitical level, we, it's hard to, hard to overstate their importance, and that certainly is not lost in Israelis. I, I think the reason why they haven't been a huge electoral issue is simply because everybody agrees with them, and, and so there's not much to contest. I mean, Netanyahu, of course, is trying to, to claim them as his own and claim them as, as, he, as something that he should get credit for. And so that, in that sense, it's part of the campaign, but it doesn't get as much mileage because there are other issues that are more in contest between the two sides. So that's how I would explain it as part of the election campaign. Oh, well, I know you know you have to go to uh, to your television channel. Just last two questions. Uh, this time I'm not seeing uh, those uh, large pictures, life-size pictures of international leaders with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Like last time in last election, he projected himself with Donald Trump, even with Mr. Narendra Modi. Uh, is it due to the Joe Biden factor? Um. Well, listen. Um. You're right. Obviously, we're not going to see pictures of Netanyahu and Trump for obvious reasons. 
As for Narendra Modi and Vladimir Putin, listen, Israel wants good relations, certainly wants good relations with India. Obviously, that's a consensus. Yeah. We wants a, a we line of dialogue with Vladimir Putin. Obviously, there's a consensus, but I don't know that that's going to be enough to sell himself on billboards and can't really put himself up there with Joe Biden in the same way. Uh, but you're right. Netanyahu's personal relationships with foreign leaders haven't been an issue in this campaign or part of his campaign the way they have been in the past. Uh, for the obvious reason, again, there's a new occupant in the White House. Uh, pictures of him signing the Abraham Accords obviously have been part of his campaign, but not as prominently. Uh, but, you know, this is a different kind of campaign. Netanyahu is running on the vaccinations. He's running to some degree on the Abraham Accords. He's running on drawing a contrast between himself and his main challenger, the opposition leader, Yair Lapid, who is basically the leader of, of a center-left slash anti-Netanyahu bloc that is, that is campaigning against Netanyahu. So it's a different kind of campaign. But you're not seeing it in that sense, but you are seeing the same kind of messaging in that Netanyahu, those billboards, don't forget what they said in Hebrew, in another league, right? Netanyahu basically saying, I'm the big man. I'm the one who goes okay. into a relationship with Donald Trump. My challengers are all dwarves. And that messaging, that he's a larger-than-life figure and the others can't compete with him, very, very much a part of this campaign. One last question, Owen. Uh, we saw some days, some days back that uh, uh, Joe Biden, he stopped uh, the deal, the multi-billion dollar arm deal with Saudi Arabia and put it for a review. Uh, similarly, with United Arab Emirates, the F-35 fighter jet deal, they also put it again in review. So is... Uh, Joe Biden giving a message to Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel, don't come in between the uh, Iran uh, nuclear treaty. Otherwise, uh, we will be harsh enough upon you. Is, is he giving some message to three? Because we are today in geopolitical scenario, uh, three of you, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Israel, uh, they are considered as a single camp in the Middle East. So yeah. is it a message for you guys? It's a message. I, I don't I think it's not as simple as being only around the Iran deal. Biden wants to take a more confrontational posture to Saudi Arabia across a range of issues. And I, I agree with I think what you're hinting at. I personally don't get it. I don't think it makes much sense. If he wants to publish the report on MBS and on the Shikhojoki affair, yeah. I can understand that. I don't necessarily personally have an objection to that. But to actually use that as a way of beating down the Saudi leadership, and I know he, he stopped from going full force in terms of, of imposing sanctions. But even what he already did doesn't make to me much sense in terms of advancing what I think America's interests are in the region. Doesn't make him any much sense to me. I mean, Saudi Arabia is a country that's a loyal American ally that is interested yeah. in furthering American interests, that's by no means anti-American. And for as many flaws for which he deserves criticism, MBS is also a reformer in terms of trying to reform the Saudi relationship to religion. You know, so I don't really fully understand it. As for the Iran deal, yeah, obviously Biden wants to move forward at his pace with Iran diplomacy. Fortunately, from Israel and Saudi and Saudi Arabia and in the UAE's perspective, he hasn't yet jumped in on the deal. He's trying to at least make some more conditions before he does. Uh, but I, you're right that he wants to send a message to these countries not to interfere. But at the end of the day, he's going to do what he wants on that. And these countries are going to have to figure out what kind of strategy they have to counter that policy. And I suspect that they are hard at work uh, because none of these countries will welcome the U.S. re-entering that deal. Thank you, Owen, for your precious time. I know, I know you are quite busy and uh, best of luck for your work. And viewers, we will try to get back Owen after the result on 24th or 25th. So Absolutely. Thank you. I'd love to be back. And we will do it at a time when I have more time and I can make it up to you and the viewers so we can have and, a discussion uh, as we need to. And from India's side, Salam, Namaste, Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you so much. And to you too. Okay, bye-bye. Goodbye.